morning, everybody. This is our seventh proper lecture, but this is our eighth lecture meeting, as you know. And uh, what is really interesting for today's uh, lecture is that if you follow, you know, American traditions, it's the Thanksgiving edition of our lecture today, at least in Europe. It's Thursday in America. It's still not Thursday, I think. Oh, yeah, actually it is. Uh, but on a couple of minutes after midnight in some uh, states. So uh, it's Thanksgiving. And this Thanksgiving, of course, you don't want to be in the states. There are some very hard restrictions. In some most states, not more than 10 people are allowed together in some five like in serbia you should not have more than five so uh, i have some friends in the states who want to meet, visit their grandparents but they have to do it online like this but it's not all bad news the turkey population is extremely happy uh, for this thanksgiving uh, because not so many people are preparing large quantities of turkey uh, but uh, based again on feedback from my friends uh, uh, in the States, there is a real concern that after the socially distant Thanksgiving, <laughs> tomorrow on Black Friday, there will be some large gatherings. There are huge sales announced uh, at um, Walmart and Costco and uh, also, of course, at uh, Target. Uh, so, but this all is, of course, overshadowed if you follow the news with the news that the day before Thanksgiving they discovered a monolith in Utah and they think it's alien. But let's not go into that. But it looks very small, if you ask me. It's not so spectacular. I don't know what all the fuss is about. But let's forget about that and go back to grammar. So on Thanksgiving in the States, we will make a huge leap. We are at under 50% of the verb phrase. But today, uh, I modified the slides that I used over the last couple of years, and I squeezed them. And I'm pretty sure that we will get to almost the very end of the verb phrase, and only one part will be remaining for the next week. So we are on schedule. Uh, so we are uh, long past the half point mark and we are entering the final stretch. So after today's class, only four more lectures. Uh, and as I showed you before the recording, the site is functional, not overly, let's say its navigation is not so user friendly, but that those are the limits of uh, Google sites that I'm using but i keep it up to date uh with a couple of days of delay but every week the new materials are there and the youtube issues have been resolved so all the videos are linked there or on my youtube channel if you don't want to visit the website so last week uh, we talked about verbal categories mood voice tense aspect and modality but of course not all of them so we covered in most, let's say, in the let's say the focus was on mood, indicative, imperative, subjunctive. We practiced it on Tuesday, and I'm pretty happy to uh, report that you are um, you are very good at analyzing uh, different types of mood. Uh, so the key thing there is to not confuse the past subjunctive, which is the form ver use hypothetically with modal past any other verb but not verb so i wish i knew the answer is past indicative and uh, i wish i were somewhere else right now that's past subjunctive uh, we also started talking about voice general discussions uh, how you do it uh, why you do it and uh, we stopped at uh, the first voice constraint, the verb related constraint. So today we have to finish object, meaning, and frequency constraints, and then move to other verbal categories. We also analyzed tense, present, and past, but that was not so new for you. Primary and secondary meaning of present and past, they uh, present simple 
uh, past tenses, so they actually refer to everything, but it's only their primary meaning that is either present or past. So, without much further ado, verbal categories uh, that we are currently dealing with, the verbal category that we're dealing with is the voice, and we finish the constraints on uh, verbs, uh, the most important of which was that uh, only transitive verbs can be passivized, and even some transitive ones cannot be passivized, primarily those that are like uh, stative verbs and some existential verbs. Uh, and uh, you remember the examples of this dress becomes her, she is become by the dress. So stative and existential verbs cannot be passivized. Now we are into the second of the constraints. So uh, why you can sometimes not use the passive voice. These are constraints. So you can always use the active voice, almost always. There are a couple of verbs which only appear in the passive. She is said to be a great writer. You cannot really, or she, yeah. uh, you cannot find a nice uh, active counterpart for that phrase, let's say. But mostly there are more constraints on the passive voice. And now we will talk about objects. So how uh, you actually sometimes cannot passivize because of certain features of the object. In order to do that, uh, this is very good for your general, let's say, continuous um, education on se uh, sentence elements and analysis of sentences into sentence elements. As you know, from our constant practice in uh, Svoza, the analysis of syntactic constituents, uh, some objects are nominal objects, in other words, noun phrases. And some objects, which uh, some of you don't really like, but it's a matter of life, it's simply the way it is, some objects are clauses. So uh, based on this, there are some constraints, there are some limits on what can be passivized. Uh, and we will now look at uh, constraints, so limits to passivization in nominal objects, so MPs, uh, like typical ones with a noun as a head, and also NPs where the pronoun is the head. And you'll see that those constraints are actually uh, bigger than constraints on regular noun phrases. And then we will talk about constraints on clauses uh, function as objects, how and when you can passivize the object, which is a clause. Uh, and there, Again, uh, we will notice that uh, what we talked about previously makes perfect sense, that it's extremely relevant, because you will see that uh, there are differences on how you passivize objects, uh, as which are clauses, if those clauses are finite, like jo John saw that Mary was pretty, non-finite infinitive, like John hoped to kiss her, and non-finite uh, that have participles as their heads. So John enjoyed seeing her, or, or um, yeah, that's actually the, a good example. So let's look at the first group. So objects that are nominal objects. So noun phrases with heads as nouns and pronouns. So, uh, there are actually very few restrictions on uh, objects that, that are noun phrases if the head is a noun and they are sporadic and there's no real system. The real, uh, let's say, systematic constraints are constraints when the object contains a pronoun as the head. But you, in order to sound ex like experts, of course, you will not say, there are limits on how you can passivize something that is in an object and is a pronoun. You will say there are constraints on passivization when objects are pronominal. Huh? That sounds very scientific. It's You constantly have to sell your skills. So you sell yourself all the time, not in a bad way. You sell your expertise, you sell your knowledge. So always try to use in of course, the right situations, these um, scientific terms. So let me show you uh, some examples and then you will see the restrictions. So 
John could see himself in their mirror. If you try to passivize this, you get something that is terrible. Himself could be seen in the mirror. Uh, so obviously, uh, himself cannot be passivized. And this applies to yourself, myself, every single pronoun that has self. Does anybody remember the term, what we call pronouns that end in self in English? Reflexive. Yes. So fundamentally, that's the restriction. When you have a reflexive pronoun in the object, it cannot be passivized. And then there are some pronouns that express something that is very similar to reflexive pronoun, but it's not, let's say, I and myself, he and uh, himself. There are, let's say, there's not one person, there are several persons. So this is something like we could see each other in the fog. Uh, this is very similar to we could see uh, ourselves in the fog, but instead of ourselves, which is a reflexive pronoun, you use this each other. And it's still bad. Each other could hardly be seen in the fog. Terrible, doesn't work. Uh, the reason why it doesn't work is that just like reflexive pronouns, each other, which is also a pronoun, by the way, but it has two words, uh, is referring to both uh per people or multiple people in v and it has to be before you mention we so if you know the term for a pronoun such as each other that's wonderful does anybody know but it's not actually a common term even if you are very into grammar uh Okay, so it's reciprocal. These are called reciprocal pronouns. So reciprocal uh, in Serbian, you know that from mathematics, from your primary and secondary schools, you'd had mathematics. Some of you and some of us uh, hated it probably. But you remember that something can be reciprocno. That's actually the meaning here. This each other is uh like a subtype of reflexive pronoun but different in the sense that it always implies more than one person but now let's look at something else this is not so easy to describe look at this sentence the handsome bold doctor shook his head uh and you try to passivize it and you get something really weird his head was shaken by the handsome, bold doctor. Uh, so, in other words, you change the meaning in the sense that it's not, uh, it's not the doctor who's uh, shaking his head uh, in the passive sentence. It's this other guy whose head is shaken because, I guess, he has a crush on the bold and some doctor. Uh, so uh, that's not the passive counterpart of this active sentence. But if you have a different pronoun, if uh, the handsome bow doctor shook her head, then uh, it's, you know, uh, then it's perfect. Her head was shaken by the handsome bow doctor. So um, notice that uh, in the first sentence, the head is the head of the doctor. In the second sentence, there is no reference, co-reference, we call it, between the subject and the, doc uh, the object. So it's not the head of the doctor, it's her head. So this is, again, fundamentally uh, like reflexive and reciprocal pronouns. But uh, this restriction is called possessive pronouns in the object. So you cannot passivize an object that has a possessive pronoun in it. And that possessive pronoun is a reference to the subject. So the, remember this example, the handsome bold doctor shook his head. So his head was shaken by the handsome bold doctor. That's not the original. I mean, it's a grammatical sentence, but it's the it's not the same meaning as the active one. So that's actually a restriction. Refre reflexive reciprocal pronouns in the object cannot be passivized ever. 
possessive pronouns can be passivized, but only if the possessive pronoun does not, in the object, does not refer to the subject. So if it's, an, if it's a different person than the subject. And that's it when it comes to nominal constraints. Now we can look at clausal constraints. So when objects are clauses, and again, to make it more, uh, let's say, realistic, uh, I didn't just give you the rules. I tried to come up with examples where we can uh, get to the answers together. So let's try to passivize three sentences. I mentioned them in the previous slides. Uh, that contain different kinds of clauses. You remember that clause, which is a finite clause, and then two types of non-finite clauses. So those clauses which have verb phrases that are infinitive, like to be, or participles, like singing, or uh, let's say bored. Um, it can be a present or it can be a past participle, but they are participles taken together. So. The first one is a uh, that clause, fine at that clause. It was, uh, John saw that she was pretty. Now, uh, what native speakers would normally do when they have to pacify something like that is not to take the whole clause. Uh, they would leave the clause at the end. Uh, and what you end up with is the passive beginning of the sentence, but we introduce the empty dummy subject it so it reads like it was seen by john or it was seen that she was pretty strictly speaking you can say that she was pretty was seen by john but it sounds really odd uh, so people will say yeah yeah it's possible but it's, it sounds odd i would always say it was seen by john that she was pretty uh, excuse oh, me, could you also yeah. say uh, she was seen as pretty by John? Yes, but that's more than just passivization. This is uh, an additional transformation. So when we uh, passivize here, this is a brilliant example. Thank you for that. Uh, but uh, as you will see in practice when we start doing this, we will try to change nothing except the voice. So what you did there also implied some additional changes to the verb phrase and the structure, which actually saves the sentence. And it sounds much better there than even it was seen that she was pretty. That sounds also a bit stupid. If you ask me, your sentence is better than that. Uh, I mean, your sentence is probably even a better choice than that. But that still isn't odd. It's not, it's simply, you know, like not maybe the first choice you would maybe rephrase it or something like that. But look what happens when you try to passivize a non finite clause, for example, with infinitive. John hoped to kiss her. Uh, you cannot say it was hoped by John to kiss her. I mean, you could say as a non-native speaker, but every native speaker will tell you that's not working. Uh, and to make it even, you know, and if you try to do the proper passivization without the dummy it subject at the beginning, so if you move the whole clause to the beginning, to kiss her was hoped by John, it sounds, uh, at least as terrible as the first one, but probably even more terrible. And the same applies to John enjoyed seeing her. It was enjoyed by John seeing her terrible. Seeing her was enjoyed by John uh, is very, very odd. I heard a couple of examples in late night television, but they were always used for comical purposes. So you will never use something like that uh, in uh, everyday situation unless you want to make some really strong <laughs> argument and it always works only in that particular context. So what can you conclude? Uh, you can conclude, and I hope you agree with me, that when you have a clausal object, only the finite one can be passivized. And even that one is not passivized directly. That sounds relatively odd. You passivize it by having the dummy it, and you leave the clause at the end, like it was seen that she was pretty. So. Um, 
a fancy way to say it is that um, if you have a finite clause function as an object and it's introduced by conjunctions such as that, whatever, or if, uh, you take the passive it subject and you do the extra position. Extra position is simply a fancy word, a term which, in, which describes what we just did. So you take uh, the dummy subject it, uh, you passivize the verb phrase, but the clause stays in its position. So uh, you could hardly expect that the truth would be on time. It could hardly be expected that the truth would be on time. Uh, that is either optional or, uh, you know, it's mostly optional, as you can see in these examples, but it can be obligatory. Uh, if uh, you have the so-called anticipatory it. Um, so, um, you know, uh, the truth would be on time, could hardly be accepted, uh, is marginally uh, acceptable, but uh, if you delete that, uh, then it's completely ungrammatical. So in other words, that, is obligatory if you move the pos uh, the subject uh, the object to the subject position for that comical or odd reasons. And with that, we finish the voice constraints on uh, objects caused by clauses. Now there are just a couple of slides on these voice constraints, and the uh, third group is the constraints of meaning. Sometimes there's nothing wrong with passivization. And in many respects, you could uh, you could have seen it already with uh, uh, the handsome, uh, tall doctor shook his head. Uh, so you can passivize it, but you change the meaning. So there we have the explanation that it has to do with uh, pronouns and what the pronoun refers to. But sometimes when there is no direct explanation with these uh, pronouns and uh, what they are co-referencing, we simply call this a uh, constraint due to meaning. Uh, so it means uh, that because of the passivization, the active sentence is no longer, um, you know, uh, doesn't mean the same in the passive voice. You change the meaning of the passive sentence. You remember? When you passivize, you shouldn't change the meaning. You should just change the focus. The queen opened the bridge. The bridge is important. The bridge was opened by the queen. It's important that it was opened by the queen, not by a local, you know, city council representative. So the voice allows you to change the focus. It shouldn't change the meaning. It should simply allow you to emphasize uh, the actors in the sentence that are really important, the subject or the object. So the best example uh, comes from the use of modal verbs. If you say John cannot do it, uh, if you passivize it, and especially if you uh, do not mention the by uh, phrase, you get a completely different meaning. It cannot be done. So John cannot do it is John's ability. You can passivize it as John is able to do it. It cannot be done is no longer ability. Now it's possibility. You would paraphrase it as it is not possible to do it. So what I'm trying to say here is not that you cannot say it cannot be done. What I'm saying is that it cannot be done is not the passive counterpart of John cannot do it. So sometimes you cannot uh, passivize because you would get a completely different meaning. So you have to be very careful about that, especially in your everyday working lives when you graduate, because very often uh, you will be asked if you work outside, let's say, educational system, you will be asked to write formal uh, letters, formal documents, uh, etc., that are usually based on uh, short emails from your bosses, supervisors, managers, and they these emails from your bosses they usually have the active voice, 
and then by definition you shift it to the passive and you add additional you know sentences to further explain but you have to be very careful when you're passivizing not to change the meaning and the last of course constraint has exactly to do with what i just told you that sometimes you will be forced to shift the voice because it's expected that in a particular situation you would use either the active or the passive voice so formal emails the passive voice uh if you're uh, you know talking next to the bubbler uh it's uh, actually the active voice the bubbler is um, a chicago term for the water cooler so all the gossip in every company usually happens around the water cooler during the breaks so that's where you hear who's dating who who got fired who might be fired who might be hired etc so uh that has to do with frequency and style so uh depending on the style uh, that you're using in your uh the in your let's say situation in that particular context you may want or you may not want to use the passive voice so the passive voice generally should always be used in informative writing and when we talked uh, talk about informative writing we are not talking about you know news announcements and uh, breaking news alerts on twitter and similar we are talking about scientific writing uh, and uh, those let's say serious articles in uh, formal and serious journals uh, the passive on the other hand should be avoided in imaginative writing like fiction it should be avoided when you're writing i don't know your horror story etc and generally it sounds very formal so you shouldn't use it in uh informal communication like the water chiller discussions that of course i just mentioned so uh it's used as i mentioned to uh change the focus uh of the sentence to change the information structure the famous example the queen opened the bridge the bridge was opened by the queen uh what i failed to mention in that exercise is that you have a third option <laughs> sometimes you want to emphasize the action itself and how you do that well you simply do not use the by phrase you can say the bridge was opened i don't care about the queen i only care about the fact that now you know i don't have to drive 40 minutes uh, around i don't know a norwegian bay i can just cross the bay uh, uh with, over this bridge so uh it's not only you know the subject or the object that can be focused you can actually focus on the action itself so there are not just two possibilities i realized as i was going through previous slides that i forgot to mention this third option and it's actually sometimes very important when you say an error was made <laughs> you don't want to mention who made an error it was probably you but that, that's why you say the error was made um, but it will be fixed you see uh, again the passive you won't fix it you will try to get somebody else to fix it uh, so the passive use uh, the passive voice is used for example in sentences such as this one Tupac Shakur was killed last night in downtown LA uh, from a documentary uh, we don't know to this very day who killed Tupac so uh, one of the primary reasons for using the passive voice is that you don't know who the agent who the doer is so when the agent is not known known you just use the passive voice uh wow the snow has been cleared here you know that it was not you you know the agent in the sense that it was not you you didn't do it uh it was somebody else who did it either a good neighbor or um, person working in the city services but uh for you it's not important or maybe it's obvious so the agent is not known the agent is not important or is obvious or the example which i gave you but in a different form a serious error in the calculation was discovered yesterday 
the agent is important the agent is probably known uh, but you don't want to mention the agent because it was probably your fault so you want to avoid mentioning who the agent is uh, the samples were analyzed uh, with a thermal scanner is the next sentence. For some reason, I see it earlier than it appears on the screen. Uh, I have dual screen set up right now. Uh, but this is actually what I talked about, informative scientific writing. So generally, when you compare scientific writing and, uh, for example, uh, subtitles from movies, uh, from uh, transcripts from television. The ratio is that, uh, let's say, 90% of sentences in, the, in scientific writing uh, do not contain personal pronouns such as I and you. Uh, the, the situation is the opposite in television and subtitles, everything that resembles, uh, you know, everyday conversation. There, 90% of, uh, of sentences contain I, you, and we. So uh, that's when you should use the passive voice all the time. And you can earn a lot of money uh, if you translate scientific articles for people from uh, working at universities. They always need to publish in English. Their English is terrible. You can also earn some money by helping them fix uh, the papers when they, uh, you know, they have their scientific papers rejected. They say, like, the topic is great, your analysis is great, but your English is terrible, and that's where you charge some money. Uh, and finally, uh, there's also, uh, let's say, uh, a set of two additional possibilities. Like the new Garnier commercial can be seen on all channels. The subject is general, you know, the local distributor, or I can see it on all channels, and you, all you can see it on all channels. And when the subject, like in this sentence, when the suspect arrived home, he was arrested by a detective. Uh, when you simply think that the active voice is not appropriate for the situation. This is, again, like scientific writing. But, uh, for example, in different uh, professions, uh, you have certain rules, especially if you watch British crime series like Midsummer Murders, etc., you will know that in situations when you have these formal arrests, they favor, again, the passive voice. It's, uh, it would be wrong to say a detective arrested him uh, somehow. You know, uh, that's just a convention. And with that, we finish the voice. Congratulations to all of us. Now we have only three verbal categories remaining. Aspect, right? And on top of, uh, uh, in addition to aspect, we have uh, modality. Actually, it's two. Yeah, we only have two verbal categories remaining, uh, aspect and modality. Yeah, so uh, today we will finish aspect. And uh, I'm not sure that we will be able to start modality. That's why I told you next week we start the noun phrases and it's the final stretch. So what is aspect? You remember the fancy definition, I hope. You should remember it, memorize it, be able to, you know, say it in the middle of the night when somebody awakes you, because this is what makes you sound professional. You cannot, you know, give some weird explanations on the aspect. You have to know the definition. And the definition sounds amazing, you know. When you say to somebody who's not a linguist, they think that you know you are the smartest person in the world. Because the definition is that aspect is a verbal category which allows you to uh, view the internal temporal structure uh, of a situation or activity expressed by the verb and to see it in different ways. That's the implication. So. Uh, aspect is about how you see the internal temporal structure expressed by the verb, whether it's the situation for stative verbs or activity for, ac for uh, active dynamic verbs. So what, what does this really mean? Uh, 
let's try to test our intuition. So uh, let's contrast sentences such as look so junior is squashing I. Look so junior has squashed I. Look so junior squashes I every time. And at this point, you think Kavgic, because of his ongoing medical issues, I actually have some viruses that I'm battling, but not the coronavirus. I have Adeno. Uh, so uh, he's lost his mind. His sentence sound ungrammatical. Well, if you know popular culture, they are not really ungrammatical. These sentences are actually quite grammatical. And I will now allow you, uh, um, not allow you, I will actually change the sharing so that we can contextualize them together. Uh, you may have already seen this video, uh, but I cannot play it because of uh, Google uh, YouTube restrictions. But what I can do is I can use YouTube which is supported by Google Meet as the only platform for sharing audio and video. So I will play it back from um, I will play it back from um, YouTube. So just give me a second. I will be sharing a tab, um, and now you will see who Luxo Junior is and what do I mean by Luxo Junior squashes I. Uh, so I think the tab from YouTube is coming up, so you should hear the sound. That look to Junior. Okay, so now, if you didn't know, now you know. Luxo Jr. is actually the sweet little lamp, you know, from uh, every Pixar movie, from the beginning of the Pixar movie. Uh, Luxo Jr. was actually the character used in the first Pixar movie ever. Uh, Pixar was, by the way, created by Steve Jobs, who created Apple. And they, you know, when they were seeking investments, they created a short video in 1980s when uh, Luxo Jr. is playing with her, uh, with his mom, uh, Luxo mom. That's a big lamp. Uh, so um, now you have the context, I hope. So uh, with the context, you uh, do agree that uh, in the beginning of each uh, video uh, or beginning of each, um, let's say, cartoon by Pixar, Luxo Jr. is squashing I. But in a no Pixar movie, has Luxo Jr. Squ has he squashed I. He was only squashing it. Uh, and it never happens that you can say Luxo Jr. squashes I 
every time. Maybe you can say Luxo Jr. is quashing I every time, but uh, you, you don't want to say that you have this blood stain. So in other words, uh, what these three sentences show you is that you can use grammatical constructions to see one and the same activity, Luxo Jr. doing something to the letter I, uh, but to contextualize it, oh, it worked, okay? Uh, so when you say Luxo Jr. is squashing I, the uh, main idea that you have in your brains, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this should be universal, is that this is what's happening. Luxo Jr. is squashing, but there's no end. So you see the activity as being in progress. The outcome, whether this ends now and the a cartoon begins, or you have a blood stain, that's irrelevant. You are focused on this small part of the ongoing activity. When I say Luxo Jr. has squashed I, the idea that forms in your head the photo the image that forms in your head is this from the parody looks so junior has squashed eyes so it's not ongoing you don't see it as ongoing you don't see it actually in the process at all you see the effects of the activity you only see the consequences so the activity itself is completely not important it's unimportant you focus on the outcome but when you say luxo junior squashes i every time uh with a little bit of you know uh extending it a little bit if you think about it as let's say uh the activity of squashing uh you think of every single movie that uh, Pixar has made. I couldn't put them all because of the limits on the size of the animation in um, PowerPoint. So I only uh, I had to stop at 2007, I think, with Toy Story uh, 3. Uh, but in every single movie, this happens. So Luxo Jr. squashes I every time means that this happens always you focus on when it happens you focus in other words on the time of activity so this is what we mean when we say that aspect uh, allows you in combination with tense to see the activity the internal temporal structure of activity in different ways so this contrast between these three sentences, Luxo Jr. is squashing I, etc., is the contrast that comes from the aspect. The first one, activity in progress, is the progressive aspect. That's why it's called progressive. Luxo Jr. has squashed I. It's the focus on the outcome. That's the perfect aspect. Perfect denotes that the activity that's based on the Latin meaning of this word, that means that the activity is actually finished. You only see the effects of the activity. And this one, Luxo Jr. squashes I every time, is called present simple because there is no progressive and there's no perfect aspect. You only have the tense. You only look at the time. So... Uh, this is not, so all those constructions, you already talked about it, that you know as tenses, pre the present simple tense, the present perfect tense, the present progressive tense, they are actually all, three of them are the same tense, they are the present tense. What is different in those constructions is actually the aspect. So uh, you combine the present tense with three different types of types of aspect progressive aspect perfect aspect or no aspect you know when you tell somebody i love you and that person is just silent uh the absence of saying something also means something so the fact that you're not using the progressive aspect or the perfect aspect is in itself uh, another meaning so uh, that's why you have uh, all these constructions. So we shouldn't really call them tenses. Uh, what you know as tenses are actually combinations of tense and aspect 
and then you use the progressive and the perfect uh, aspect or perfective aspect or no aspect to really describe what's happening. And these are actually what we call a spectral opposition. So spectral oppositions is a fancy word for how you see this internal structure, whether you focus on the activity, whether you focus on the outcome, whether you focus on when it happened. So you don't care how it happened, that's uh, progressive. You don't care what effect it had, that's the perfective. You simply want to know when it happened. That's no progressive, no perfect, that's just tense. So based on that, we have several possibilities uh the, that are called a, a spectral opposition so uh i have them uh here so uh the first opposition that's john ate an apple versus john was eating an apple when i entered john ate an apple in your mind means that there's john and somewhere maybe in his hand maybe in the trash can there's the core of the apple it's over the apple is eaten it happened in the past what you're saying is the apple is eaten it happened in the past and you're not even talking about the effects it's a simple statement that this happened in the past but if you say john was an eating an apple when i entered the image that you have in your mind is not really an image it's an animation that i inserted here you see like an infinite loop like those uh, GIFs uh, or GIFs, that's a big discussion on the internet, how you should pronounce it. But, um, and I don't want to take sides there, uh, but uh, fundamentally that's, uh, you don't see it as a single still image from the past. You see it as an animation in the past. This is this internal structure. So, uh, ate an apple is finished, was eating an apple is not finished ate an apple is complete there's nothing left to eat uh, was eating is incomplete there's still something there to be eaten there are still parts of this juicy apple to be bitten off and uh, chewed and then you know digested uh, there are no segments uh in john ate an apple and uh here there are segments segments are like frames you can divide this activity into frames and this is the spectral position in english progressive versus non-progressive so when you say that uh john ate an apple is the present the sorry the past simple tense what you're also saying is that it's non-progressive and non-perfective so simple actually means non-progressive and non-perfective but it's easier to say simple because that means that there is no progressive aspect and there is no perfective aspect so here with this example you have a perfect illustration of progressive versus non-progressive and uh, when I mentioned segments, uh, you will talk about segments throughout your studies. Here, uh, since we are all adults, I came up with some public domain footage, uh, which can be used to explain what segments really are. So uh, I told you that you should think about segments as frames. Uh, officially, you cannot say that they are frames. You can, uh, I can frames in a video you officially have to say that segments are individual parts or phases of an activity denoted by the verb of course that taken together make up the whole activity so that's why i mentioned the frame so uh if you have a sentence such as a naked man is running the activity is this animation which is the first ever animation made with uh before the lumiere brothers so this is in the public domain it's one of the earliest examples of a film you could call it but when you split this short animation uh you get the segments the segments are the frames in this case they had only 16 frames per second i think no 12 frames per second 
so only 12 frames today we have 24 by the way uh in states 25 uh so these are actually the segments together these parts like these frames of a movie make up the whole activity when you put it in a loop and speed it up the segments give you the animation so that's actually how you should think of the segments uh and when you say that john ate an apple has no segments it really has no segments how would you create frames for john ate an apple i see that the apple is gone he has a smile on his face i cannot divide it into segments but john is eating an apple or john was eating an apple you can show segments right uh and uh, the progressive aspect because of this segment these segments because the activity has segments you can loop it but sometimes segments are not the same right if you say they are building uh they were building this house for seven years and they will finish tomorrow they were building this house for seven years uh, if you make segments they are all different right the house is growing and they're doing different uh, work every day on the house. So you don't have to think of segments as something that is just a loop. Segments can also be really like frames in the movie that are not in a repeat mode, but you can split it in segments like building the foundation, uh, building the walls, uh, making the roof, installing uh, you know, electricity, etc. So because of that, because the, of the fact that you have these uh, segments, the progressive aspect is used as a temporal frame. So uh, it doesn't always is used just to indicate that the activity is in progress, that it's going on. Its secondary function is to provide the frame, temporal frame, time reference in a way for other activities. So John was reading, when i entered you are saying there are these segments john is sitting and uh, flipping the pages of the book and in one of those segments i interrupt him so uh this is you know the frame is these segments and then you are saying one of those segments is where i stop the activity with something else uh just a single segment of the past simple tense you see this is the difference between also the present uh, the past simple tense and the past progressive because uh, i entered is one segment no there are no multiple segments i just entered and it's an event and it's finished and it's not divided into parts etc the other spectral position is the opposition between john lived in new york and John has lived in New York since 1999. Uh, this example uh, has been the example, um, uh, is the example that I have been using for almost a decade. Although right now there are people, you know, dying in New York because of COVID, I retain the example because I think of it is in more scientific terms. I hope it's not being offensive. Uh, so John lived in New York. Fundamentally means that he's either now living in Chicago or theoretically that he's dead. That's another possibility. Now in uh, both cases, he's no longer living in New York, either because he's dead or because he moved. But if you say John has lived in New York since 1999, you still see uh, John as being in New York most of the time and sleeping in New York and eating in New York, etc. So John lived in New York just like John ate an apple is finished, but John has lived in New York is not finished. It is continuing up to now. Uh, John lived in New York is also complete, uh, and it in complete in the sense that uh, by complete we he mean here uh, it has almost nothing to do with our present day discussion. It's just a fact. Uh, but when you say John has lived in New York, it's not complete. It's still relevant. So there are consequences right now. In one of the consequences is that he's definitely alive. John lived in New York again, no segments. You see this, uh, his life in New York has a single stretch of the timeline, no sub segments. 
Uh, if you say John has lived in New York since 1999, you see that there are, uh, again, no segments, but there is the result. You see the outcome, the result of the activity up to now. And this spectral opposition is perfect or perfective aspect versus non-perfective. And again, when we say that something is, let's say, the past simple tense, it implies that it's non-perfective and non-progressive. So simple means no aspect, in other words. So these are the main oppositions, progressive versus non-progressive and perfective versus non-perfective. And together, they give you what you know as tenses. So when it's non-perfective and non-progressive, you get simple, uh, the past simple and the present simple when uh, you, uh, so that's actually uh, here. You see, these are the ones. They are non-progressive and they are also, um, they're non-perfective and they're non-progressive. Everything else, that you know as a tense is a combination of tense and some aspects the perfect aspect plus tense gives you the present perfect and the past perfect the present tense and the progressive is present progressive past, the past simple tense plus progressive the past progressive and you can even combine both aspects and then you get the present perfect progressive and the past perfect progressive so this is how tenses that you know them as got their names but they are not tenses this is something that you can bring up when somebody is playing you know a smart test uh and they think they know what they are talking about grammar you can tell them as soon as they say that the present perfect is a tense you tell them no it's not don't think of it as a tense it's an uh aspect tense and aspect combination so, so these are uh, actually the pos possible combinations. There are four of them. The four, the, the, there are four possible combinations. And of course, uh, you see them here. Uh, so it can be either uh, perfect, um, it can be progressive or non-progressive. So, sorry, simple, progressive, perfective, and perfect progressive. Uh, Okay, and my animations are uh, stuck there. So what comes next? Uh, what comes next, we have 30 minutes, is that we have to say something about each of these aspects. So something about the perfect aspect, something about the progressive aspect, something about the perfect progressive aspect, which should be bolded here. I'm being terrible. Uh, so, um, uh, Okay, so very briefly, you will lose the you will lose the presentation. I just fixed it, so you should see the presentation now. Uh, so uh, the perfect progressive aspect is now properly uh, uh, treated in typography. So let's talk about the perfect aspect, uh, the first of the uh, three possibilities. The perfect aspect, as you now know, I don't have to go into details, uh, can convey the meanings that are expressed through uh, these three sentences. John had lived in London before he moved to New York. Uh, also in fairy tales, Mother Bear, when she says, somebody has slept in my bed. And also uh, there is the third possible meaning, we have painted the walls. These sentences, uh, explain the three meanings we actually identify them all in the introductory discussions but um uh here you have them with additional examples so john had lived in london before he moved to new york it means that there's continuing duration up to now or in this case up to then so it doesn't have to be up to now with the past perfect, it can be duration up to a point in the past. That's why you have the past perfect uh, construction in the first place. 
uh, when you say somebody has slept in my bed, that's not continuing duration because Goldilocks is no longer in Mother Bear's bed. She's gone. She fled when she heard the bears are approaching, but the results are there. So this is a subtle difference, but an important difference. So the first one is activity continuing up to now. Here, the activity actually finished uh, earlier. Uh, but we see still the results of the activity. This is like when you see a friend that you have not seen uh, for years and he's wearing a plaster cast and you say, oh my God, you've broken your arm. Uh, you have broken your arm means like I see your cast. I see that it's still broken. So it's the result that you see and also sometimes it's not possible to distinguish. That, that's both result and continuing up to now. Uh, and the last one is completion. We have painted the walls. We just finished it. So there was this continuing duration. And now we put a full stop there and it's the end. So we just, so this is also the, the perfect aspect is sometimes used like to denote that you have finished something huge. Uh, so for example, when um, when people who are native speakers finish their PhD thesis, they would say like, I have just finished my PhD thesis. So it's completed now. I can go do something else. So uh, the perfect aspect, uh, because of these multiple meanings, at three of them, and uh, different you know ways in which you can uh, express it, and different contexts in which that can be used is classified in a very complex way. So the present perfect aspect as a type of aspect is divided into uh, three subtypes, the first of which is the event perfect. Uh, and this event perfect is further divided into indefinite past use, which has further subdivision into experiential perfect and recent past uh, but this indefinite past use is just one type of event perfect the other is uh, perfect of result and there's a third possibility for event perfect and that's definite past use that sounds weird because you know from your previous education that the perfect aspect is usually not used uh, with definite past. So if you say John was born in 1978, it's not possible to say John has been born in 1978. It sounds terribly ungrammatical. But there are situations when the perfect can be used with a definite time reference, and you'll see when. Uh, it's actually very straightforward, but you'll see. Uh, then uh, all of this is just, you know, the subclassification of event perfect. The good news is, is that the remaining groups are not that complex. So in addition to event perfect, you have state perfect, you have habitual perfect, and just like every classification in the world, almost, especially in linguistics, there is a fourth group of uh, let's say uses or types of the perfect aspects and that's special cases that simply means that the classification is not perfect we have to actually give you know, like a, have a special group for those marginal cases so uh, let's now deal with the event perfect you remember and you see here it has multiple subtypes indefinite past use perfect of result and definite past use and indefinite past use itself has two sub subtypes experiential and recent past uh, i will go quickly through these slides because you actually know this it's just that you didn't call it um uh like perfect aspect and these spectral oppositions but this is tackled usually in the use of english when you do uh when you take courses in english uh, at private schools and also at state schools and if you get tested for english this is actually what's covered by the use of english so this is uh let's say relevant for higher levels uh, like advanced and proficiency in Cambridge terms, 
or C1 and C2 in the European framework of languages. So let's look at event perfect um, and its first uh, subtype, indefinite past use. So this is actually very common. Uh, for the perfect aspect. So it denotes that something happened in the past and is still relevant. Maybe it's still ongoing. So there is a relationship between a present uh, moment, if it's present perfect, and the past situation. Or if you use the past perfect, there's a relationship bet between, a, let's say, a situation in the distant past and a more recent past moment and uh this uh these these types of perfect aspects are only used with indefinite past time expressions so um let me give you some examples uh with first ex experiential perfect that's for example have you ever been to china that's indefinite past use experience we call it subtype one of indefinite past use experiential perfect in your life experience has ever there been a trip to china that's what you're asking uh i have never met such a person in my whole life you see uh there is no uh adverbial for um definite time of course it has to be indefinite ever never etc uh and something like i have she act, she has acted in two plays up to now uh, it's experiential in the sense that she's still active as an actress and she may uh, find other roles. But when you compare it to uh, non perfective aspects, so if you use the past simple tense, she acted in two plays in her life. So she either is dead or she stopped acting. But you see, there's no experience and relevance up to now the same applies to past perfect we went to china in 1998 i had never been there before so this is the experience from the past uh so uh she got the academy award in 2004 she acted in three films by then uh so before up so, for example, if now is 2004, we would say she has acted in three films by now. Uh, but if you talk about 2004 from the point of view of now, you have to use the past perfect for everything that happened before 2004. And, uh, for example, I had visited five foreign countries before I was 21. Uh, now I'm 43. Uh, and uh, that's not true unless you count Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Montenegro, Macedonia as foreign countries at the time when I was young, that was still one country. Mm. So that's actually indefinite past use, experiential, perfect. You use it with these adverbials such as ever, never, up to now, by now, before, etc. This is still, uh, you know, indefinite past use, but there's this other subtype, and that's recent past. So this is not about experience. This is about something that has just happened. So with present perfect, this is, again, what you know very well. She has called me this morning. You can say this if it's still morning. Uh, so uh, you can use this morning, although it looks like a violation of the rules that you should not use definite time expressions with the present perfect. But this uh, expression is possible if it's still morning. So if you say she has called me this morning and it's 10 a.m., this sentence is perfect. Uh, on the other hand, if you uh, are talking about this call in the afternoon, you would have to say, did she call you this morning? So at 2 p.m. when the morning is finished, you can no longer use present perfect because it's no longer recent past. So you use the simple past with no perfective aspect. Similarly, I haven't seen him lately. Use it with indefinite past time expressions. But uh, you say, uh, I saw him five minutes ago, if you use the definite past time expressions. So that's the difference between, for example, have you seen John and did you see John? Uh, have you seen John is something that you would ask your colleague at work 
while you are still at the office. Like uh, that's fundamental, like asking, where's John? Do you know where John is? Did you see John is, for example, you're talking to a friend of yours from work, but you're talking in the evening when you're both at home. And then you say, like, did you see John? It's over. It was in the past. So you don't use the present perfect. The same applies to past perfect. So something like when we arrived at the theater, the play had already begun. Uh, when I arrived home, everybody had already gone to bed. And uh, what is really weird is that for this uh, type of indefinite past use, recent past use, you actually sometimes can use definite time adverbials like today, this year, but usually you also use those indefinite past time expressions like recently, just yet, already, lately. And that's actually uh, the event perfect. Uh, now, uh, I mean, the first subtype, indefinite past use. Now there's the second type of event perfect. That's the perfect of result. And again, you know this. This is the result that is still valid either now or it was valid in the past. I gave you an example. Now here it is again. Tom has broken his leg. So his leg is still broken. He's in pain. He's in cast. Uh, if you say Tom broke his leg last week, so broke, not has broken, then you're not focusing on Tom's suffering. You're focusing on the fact that it happened last week and not, let's say, two days ago. So when you use the past simple tense, it's simply about when something happened. When you use the present perfect, it's about relevancy, uh, consequences, experience, etc. cetera. Uh, here, it's about the results, so consequences in the, in the sense. She has lost her key keys and is looking for them now so the keys are still not found she cannot return home guess what i found a new job uh so you are now employed that's the implication the result is you are now employed the same applies to the past perfect uh, but from the point of view of the past tom couldn't play the match because he had broken his leg so it's he was incapacitated she had lost uh, her keys and was looking for them everywhere. She couldn't return home because the keys were gone. Uh, as you can see here, uh, this type of the perfect aspect usually uh, is indicated by the absence of adverbials. There are no adverbials used in these examples. Um, so uh, another famous example of, of uh, let's say, um, of this perfect of result is Elvis has left the building. The result is that the building is Elvis less. Uh, so uh, that's uh, the perfect of result as well. Uh, type three uh, in the event perfect group is definite past use. Uh, as I mentioned, this is counterintuitive. And you're right when you say that it's counterintuitive because the present perfect cannot be used to denote definite past, no matter what you try. It's completely incompatible with definite past use for events. But the past perfect can be used to denote um, events in the definite uh, moment in time, but it only happens. Uh, uh, when you are talking about, um, you know, an earlier time from the point of view of a more recent past event. So here you have the example. Uh, they, the baby was born after they had moved into the house. So uh, moving into the house is actually a specific moment but it's uh, denoted by the past perfect, but mostly because the fact that it establishes that it was before uh, uh, moving into the, uh, the house. And that's actually the first group of the meanings, that's event perfect. Now there's the second group, which is much simpler, no subclassifications there, state perfect. State perfect denotes uh, that some state is valid uh, up to now. 
Uh, and uh, this is something like we have known each other since 1989 and we still know each other. We have known each other for 10 years. He has lived in Canada for five years. Unlike the example which we analyzed with the past simple tense, he lived in Canada for five years. He no longer lives there or he's dead. In the past perfect, the same thing, but from the point of view of the past, before they got married, they had known each other for seven years. So usually use it for stative or existential verbs to denote that the state is was uh, was not is not complete, it is relevant and continues up to the moment of your utterance. So it actually um, you you actually use this uh, state perfect to emphasize the duration, and that's why adverbials that you use in this uh, sense of the perfect aspects are adverbials of duration. So far, up to now, since for, uh, and state perfect is similar to habitual perfect, but uh, state perfect is simply about you know duration. Habitual uh, perfect is about also duration and repetition. So with present perfect, that's something like the magazine has been published every month since 1990. He has sung in this choir for 20 years. So of course, here we mean that you know he didn't sing uh, every. A day, but every weekend or something like that. Uh, and in the past perfect, it's something like he had played in the national team for 10 years before he retired. So uh, the difference between state and habitual is that state is continuous. Habitual has repetitions, but there are intervals when there there is no activity. Because if you're a football player, for example, one of the football gods died yesterday. May he rest in peace, Diego Maradona. So he didn't play for the national Argentinian team every single day. That would be uh, state perfect. So like we have known each other. We didn't suddenly forget each other at one day and then remember. Uh, so that's the difference. Uh, and finally, the fourth group of perfect aspect meanings is the special uses. So uh, these are uh, the uses that we cannot put anywhere else. These are like exceptions. When uh, the perfect aspect uh, is used either as the present perfect or the past perfect and it has some weird time reference or meaning. So for present perfect, this, this can be, for example, future time reference. Uh, that's uh, secondary meaning. That's not really related to aspect. That's uh, an exception. I'll return the book after I've read the first two chapters. Uh, for the past perfect, that's when it, for example, refers to basic past, not the past which is further in in the in history than something else in the past. So this is when you, for example, um, use attitudinal past perfect, I had wondered if you are or if you were free now, so when you are being polite. And more commonly, this is used when uh, you are when you create indirect speech. So she said she hadn't met him, but actually in the direct speech, it is, uh, sh uh, she said, Colin, uh, I didn't meet him. So this hadn't met him actually means did not meet him, but it's only in the past perfect because of the indirect speech. And of course, the past uh, perfect has uh, a, a secondary meaning that has to do with hypothetical meaning. We know that when we were talking about subjunctive, that sometimes the past, the, the past simple and the past perfect are used to um, for hypothetical past. So we won't be talking about past simple, but past perfect is used in hypothetical conditional clauses. If you had helped him, he wouldn't be in trouble. Hypothetical comparison, he dressed her as, as if they had met before, but of course they didn't meet before. And uh, wishes, I wish I had met him before, as well as all other hypothetical expressions that are not, uh, uh, you know, clauses, conditions, wishes, but imagine they had fallen in love with each other, but they didn't. 
And with only seven minutes remaining, we have the progressive and the progressive uh, perfective aspect to cover. Uh, so I think we can do it. The, um, the whole logic here is that I'm talking you through these slides. But the assumption is, the reason why I'm talking fast is that m you know this. You just maybe didn't call it hypothetical condition. You maybe didn't call it the experiential present perfect. Maybe you didn't call it event perfect or state perfect. But you actually know these uses because you all have high English skills. Uh, the same applies to the progressive aspect. So the progressive aspect, you know all these meanings. Uh, but maybe you just use different terms or you maybe didn't uh, do it in a comprehensive uh, way when you just focus on the progressive aspect, but maybe you did it over three years in a course book like Headway or Advanced Gold or something like that. So progressive aspect is about situation that is in progress and it has these meanings illustrated by these sentences. They were working all afternoon. He's working as a cabbie, although he has a PhD in literature. He's painting the wall. And uh, finally, something like this. Come on, you can't really like that guy. He's like always talking about NASCAR and nothing else. So the first one is about duration, all afternoon. He's working as a cabbie uh, with a PhD in literature. Hopefully, that's temporariness for that guy. He's painting the wall but the wall hasn't been painted yet so this is incompleteness and here you really can believe that a smart lady like that uh, ha is hanging out with a guy who's on into nesca racing so that's called emotional coloring when you want to uh, actually indicate your um, frustration or your anxiety or uh, your surprise or something like that, some kind of an emotional state. Usually that something annoys you is what you use this for. So the progressive aspect, uh, before we say anything else over the next four minutes, uh, cannot occur uh, with stative verbs. So with stative verbs, there's no progressive aspect. You remember that when we talked about stative and dynamic uh, parts of speech, so he's being tall, he's knowing English, uh, is uh, not possible, but they are being silly, where B is stative, and I'm seeing the boss tomorrow are possible because they are all temporary or uh, like being silly, or seeing is not actually about perception, but about a meeting. Also, I'm understanding more about quantum physics, is possible because you're changing the level of understanding so it's a it's an activity actually uh, so the progressive aspect unlike the perfective aspect can be divided into only two groups that's why i told you we can finish it quickly only event and habit so event event or eventive progressive and habitual progressive the, so the event progressive is uh for example in the present progressive things like She's living with her parents while her flat is being renovated. Uh, what are you doing? And writing a letter. So it's simply either that something is temporary or something is incomplete. In the past uh, uh, progressive, you all actually have only, uh, again, I mean, you have two meanings. Uh, the dentist was drilling my tooth for three minutes. That's, of course, duration. Or I, he was studying history all afternoon that's duration, or I was reading a book last night versus I read the book last night. So it's either duration or the same one that you have for present, and that's incompleteness. When it comes to the other group, habitual progressive, uh, again, there are only a couple of meanings, literally couple, two. Uh, she uh, usually goes to work by bus, but today she's going to work by car, temporary habit or uh, it is emotional coloring. She's always calling me when she's in trouble, so you don't hate it, you, dis you hate it, sorry. Uh, you don't hate it, but you disapprove of it. You're annoyed that you are friends only when she needs you. Uh, 
And the past progressive is uh, exemplified again through only two uh, possible uses. And that's temporary habit. Tom was uh, teaching English until the school found a full time substitute teacher. That's temporary versus again emotional coloring. So here they are exactly the same two meanings emotional coloring and temporary habit. Unlike the event progressive, where there is a slight difference between present and the past progressive. And the last slides are for the perfect progressive aspect which combines the perfect and the progressive aspect. So you have uh, the combination of up to now result with duration, temporariness, and incompletion. That's very weird, but it works. And again, you only have two subtypes, event progressive and habitual perfect progressive. Uh, a theoretical question that you can be asked that you can ask me here is uh, what about segments? Uh, didn't we say that the perfect aspect has no segments, but the progressive has segments? Well, uh, in this case, um, it's true. Uh, one has no segments, the other has usually identical segments. But when you combine them, you create actually a single sequence of segments that cannot be looped. So with the progressive aspect, you can actually usually loop these segments. But with the perfect progressive segment, the segments are never identical and they lead, they have a natural end. So segments exist, but they are not identical. So very briefly, event perfect progressive is something like I've been cleaning the windows versus I have cleaned the windows. So obviously it's about duration and incompleteness. Whereas I'm out of breath, I've been running for hours is more about, again, uh, duration, but also the result. In all both cases up to now, incompleteness, duration and result with the past progressive the same thing but with the past reference point the fire had been raging for months before it was extinguished poor california up to then incompleteness he was out of breath because he had been running for hours that's actually the result but in the past for habitual ones we are one minute over time but you forgive me one more slide so the present perfect progressive is uh, for temporary habits, like he's been scoring plenty of goals these seasons. That's a uh, temporary habit in the present. And he had been scoring plenty uh, of goals that season. That's a uh, temporary habit in the past. And with this, we actually finished, believe it or not, uh, two uh, uh, actually four not two four large verbal categories so what happens next week is that we uh, take care of modality then i give you the overview of the second midterm test and at the very end probably last uh, 30 minutes of the lecture we level up we move into the noun phrases and that is the last stretch of the course. We will have three and a half lectures of noun phrases, and uh, we are on track to do that. So I will now stop the recording uh, and stop sharing, but then uh, we can also uh, have a short discussion, although we are over time, if you have some hmm, questions, comments, etc. So uh, the